can you believe that when John Carpenter's The Thing was first released, that it was met with negative reviews and people actually criticized it and fucking hated it? What a bunch of morons. <laughs> Listening to the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Go behind the scenes of all your favorite horror movies from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now. I am your host, The Incredible Josh. Welcome, everybody, to the third episode of season two of the Cabin of Horrors podcast, and it's a brand new year. Gosh, it's been so long, I haven't talked to you guys yet all year. <laughs> but boom. Welcome into 2023. I hope everyone had an awesome new year and a great holiday. Thanks so much for tuning into this very special episode where we're going over the thing. And not just the thing, but the thing. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me here. Sorry, guys. We're going over the thing. John Carpenter's the thing. And we're going to go over both the prequel and the original John Carpenter's the thing, which I'm super excited for. I actually liked the prequel movie that came out later. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was a good homage had good connections to John Carpenter's The Thing. Not sure what everyone else thought about it, but we're going to dive deep into both of those movies, starting with the prequel and talking about how it came to be, all the awesome special effects behind the scenes. There is so much that I have for both of these movies. I'm so happy about it. So we're going to dive deep and just get started right into The Thing. So let's do this. So our story starts with producers Mark Abraham and Eric Newman. They had been fresh off the heels of creating the Dawn of the Dead remake. They began to look through the Universal Studios library to try and find some new properties to work on. They found John Carpenter's The Thing, and they convinced Universal that instead of making a remake of The Thing, they wanted to create a prequel because they felt that if they were just remaking the John Carpenter film, it would be like, quote-unquote, painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa, which is absolutely true. Because The Thing, even though it wasn't critically acclaimed, it wasn't a box office smash when it first came out, it went on to become a masterclass of practical effects. Not only that, but it has now cemented itself as a cult classic for horror fans. It's a movie that is a rite of passage, in a sense, for, for many horror fans to show other people who are coming into the genre, or even just if you want to see something that has some of the best practical effects you'll ever see in a movie, you show them the thing. So in early 2009, Variety first reported the launch of the project, which was to film a prequel to The Thing. So they got the directors and writers on board. Ronald D. Moore was brought on as the writer. And in March of 2009, he described his script as more of a companion piece to the John Carpenter film and not so much a remake. He wanted to tell the story of the Norwegian camp that found the thing before the Kurt Russell group had in the original John Carpenter film. And a lot of research was done when it came to writing the script for the film. They wanted all of the information about the Norwegian camp from the first film, even down to the smallest details, to be as accurate as possible so it could be incorporated into the prequel to try and create a consistent backstory between the two films. And the decision to name the film the same title as the first film, so to name it The Thing, <laughs> it was because producers felt that if they added a colon title, that would be something like Exorcist 2 colon The Heretic. They felt that it wasn't that impactful to have that kind of a title, which I agree with them. But at the same time, I feel like it led to their detriment because I saw the Thing prequel last year in 2022. That's actually the first time I saw it. And the reason being is because I thought it was a remake. I didn't realize that it was a prequel to the Thing. Because all I saw was a movie called The Thing. And, you know, the thing is in... <laughs> see what I did there? The, th <laughs> the thing is in horror that when you have a reboot of a movie, it's generally called the exact same thing that the original was, right? Like Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween. <laughs> like, I immediately think, oh, they remade The Thing. I don't necessarily want to see a remake of such a classic movie. So I feel like by doing that, it added to the flop that it was because 
it takes a lot for people to give a shit, right? And it takes a lot for people to see past what's in front of them and actually research and find out, you know, what a movie's about. A lot of people will judge a movie based on the trailer, based on the poster, based on the title, and leave it at that, right? You've got to get a horror fan from your trailer, from your title, or from your poster. And if your poster, your title, and your trailer smell like a remake, <laughs> a lot of people are going to assume it's a remake and not a prequel to the first film. So I feel like they could have done more with the title to make it separate itself, but that's, that's just my opinion. And the director of the film, who I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name, because I will absolutely butcher it, so we're just going to call him the director, he explained that he created the thing not to be just an everyday simple horror film. He wanted to also focus largely on the human drama with the interactions between the characters just like the first film had. Because that's what I feel like John Carpenter's The Thing did very, very well in. We'll go dive more deeper into that when that part of the episode comes in. But the human element that they added in The Thing, right? It created so much more drama and horror all on its own outside of this sci-fi alien-like creature that is shape-shifting itself into other human beings. By adding that human element and that distrust, it, it's just, there was so much, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the thing and the tones that it hit on, the social commentary. It's, it's so incredible. When time was spent to explore the characters' emotional journeys, because it allows the audience to care about them, right? If we're experiencing a character's emotional journey alongside them as they're experiencing it, that gives us an opportunity to connect with them. And once you're connected with them, well, you're engaged in the movie, you start to feel when things happen to them, and it makes for a memorable experience. It's a good way to, to reel us in, reel the audience in. Now, outside of the fact that this is, of course, a prequel to The Thing, so there's a lot of inspiration and a lot of source material to draw on from John Carpenter's The Thing, but that's not the only source of inspiration for this prequel. The filmmakers also drew inspiration from the original novel Who Goes There, specifically in making the characters of the film educated scientists instead of blue-collar workers like they were in John Carpenter's The Thing. The director also drew additional inspiration from the film Alien, which I'm sure you can see the comparisons between the main character of this film and Ripley. If you've seen this prequel, I'm, I'm sure you've made the comparisons between the two. And not only that, but the way the alien creatures are filmed in this prequel was very similar to Alien, because you don't see a lot of them. They didn't show a lot of the alien creatures, very similar to how they shot the first Alien movie. The director of the film really went all the way in making this, a vi I would say, an artistic film of sorts. Because instead of shooting this movie digitally, they shot in the anamorphic format on 35mm film. Which, for the time that this was filmed, is absolutely not the norm of shooting films, especially a movie that's expected to be such a big blockbuster like The Thing. It's surprising that it was shot on anamorphic format on 35mm film. And not only that, but the director chose not to fast cut the film and opted for a slower pace to try and build that sense of impending dread. Filming took place in Pinewood Toronto Studios Portlands on March 22, 2010 and wrapped up on June 28, 2010. On the set, the director had a laptop computer and it contained millions upon millions of screen captures from the original John Carpenter film. These were used as a point of reference to keep the Norwegian camp visually consistent with the first film. The practical creature effects that we see in the film, they were created by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. of Amalgamated Dynamics, and in addition to creating the effects for the human thing transformations, the two of them and their team had a real big challenge because they had to come up with the look of the alien in the ice block that was unearthed by the Norwegians, not something that we had seen in the uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. And initially, it was only intended to be shown as a silhouette, but the director liked their designs enough and encouraged them to fully create the creature and flesh it out, which was realized by creating a monster suit that was actually worn by Tom Woodruff. 
and the effects team really wanted to create an organic feel with this film. They really wanted to emulate the creature effects of the first film. So they opted to use cable operated animatronics instead of more complex hydraulic controls. And they were going to use traditional practical effects on the creatures whenever possible. Which I know is a little bit of a deviation from John Carpenter's thing because I'm pretty sure that considering that everything was practical effects and there wasn't really CGI back then that could create what we saw in this prequel film, but they did try to keep it... I feel like they did do a good blend of practical effects and CGI in this movie. There are times where you can obviously tell it's CGI, but the blend of the two was actually very well done in my opinion. Keeping on the practical effects of the prequel and the CGI kind of aspect, the CGI for the prequel film was created by Image Engine, and they're the same people who actually worked on District 9. And they use computer graphics to digitally create extensions on some of the practical animatronic effects. And because of this advancement of animatronic technology since 1982, when the original John Carpenter's The Thing came out, it allowed the effects team to expand upon the possible creature concepts, which is where I feel that blend came in very well, because of course, they were limited in 1982 in what they could put on screen, not only from a technological standpoint, but from a motion picture of America standpoint. Now there's a lot you can put on film. Look at Terrifier 2. That was in theaters. If that's the line, I don't think the thing is going to cross it. So being able to blend the two really did create for some pretty interesting creature concepts. One of the reasons that the director chose to use practical effects over a heavily CGI made movie was because he believed that the actors would give better performances when they have something physical to react to, which makes complete sense. You can always tell when someone's fake scared or fake surprised, or especially when it's CGI and all they're looking at is a rubber ball on a stick. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're not going to get the reaction you want because you're not going to be scared of a rubber ball on a stick. The interior of the crashed alien spacecraft was created by production designer Sean Hayworth. And to design the ship, he had to actually recreate what little was shown of the spacecraft in the Carpenter film. Then he had to fill the gaps of what was not originally shown in that film. So that's a big challenge to undertake, right? You've got this little snippet from a 1982 film, and you have to take all that set design that you can see in that small amount of time, recreate it, and then on top of that, fill in the gaps of what you think the rest of that set would look like, but not recreate it in a way that is the exact replica of the set from John Carpenter's The Thing, because it's obviously not going to be the same. There's going to be time difference and all that kind of stuff. So how do you do that in a prequel? It's challenging, but they really pulled it off. What Hayworth did was he got a team of about 12 other people, and they created the inside of the ship as a several story high interior set. And it was constructed mostly out of a combination of foam, plaster, fiberglass, and plywood. They also made the ship design specifically to look as if it was not made to accommodate humans, but rather alien creatures of a different size and shape who could walk on any surface. There's also a section of the craft which was called the pod room, and it was designed to imply the alien creatures manning it had collected specimens of different alien species from around the universe. Which I feel like would be another interesting entry into the Thing universe is to get the Thing's perspective on things. You know, what does the Thing think about all these things? Okay guys, I'll stop, sorry. <laughs> the Thing was originally set for release in April of 2011, but Universal Pictures decided to change the date to October 14th, 2011. This was to allow time for reshoots. The intention of these reshoots was to quote-unquote enhance existing sequences or to make crystal clear a few story beats or to add punctuation marks to the film's feeling of dread. The director claimed on his Facebook page that the reshoots of the film included making an entirely different ending, referring to the original cut of the film as the pilot version and the new cut as the Tetris version. <laughs> Weird way of uh, labeling that, but okay. The original ending of the film, Kate was going to discover the original pilots of the spaceship had actually been killed by the Thing, which was an escaped specimen they had collected from another planet, implying that the ship was crashed in an attempt to try and kill the monster. Which, meh, I think that's, I think that's a little too ambiguous to have an ending like that. 
I don't know if many people would have would have quite caught that. So I'm glad they went with the ending they did, especially the tie-in with the uh, with John Carpenter's The Thing. That was great. When it got to that ending, I'm like, oh, the dog. Oh, I see what they're doing here. <laughs> I loved it. Now, box office reception on The Thing, it really went the same fate as John Carpenter's The Thing, which, of course, we'll go into that as well. The Thing prequel, it grossed $8,493,665 over its opening weekend, and it was distributed to 2,996 theaters and spent a total of one week on the top 10 chart, just one week, and then dropped down to the 16th position in the second week. Its run at the box office was completed with a total gross of $16,928,670,000 in the United States. And it was called an outright disappointment right away. In foreign countries, the film grossed $14,576,617. So on a budget of $38 million, the movie only went on to bring a box office gross of $31,505,287. So it lost the studio over $6 million. Now, in my opinion, I wouldn't consider this movie a box office flop because it still made over $30 million. What I would say is the budget of this film was too high. That is my take on this, because at the end of the day, you can make a horror movie, but at the same point, could they have made this movie with a lower budget, right? There was a lot of practical effects used. There was a lot of CGI. If that budget was cut, it may have compromised the film's integrity as well. So it is a catch-22, but I don't feel like it was necessarily a box office flop in my opinion. Because it still made over $30 million. I feel like the budget was just too high for a horror movie in general. $38 million for a horror movie? I don't know. Damien Leone did Terrifier on, what, half a million dollars, was it? Come on. <laughs> I, 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 that's just my opinion. Be creative. Be creative on a budget. Carpenter was. Carpenter was always creative on a budget. Dude made freaking Halloween on under a million dollars. Don't tell me that you can't make a horror movie for less than $30 million. <laughs> like House of a Thousand... Like, no, come on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to stand on this hill. I might get heat for it, but I'm going to stand on this. The budget was too high. The budget was just way too high in the Thing prequel. $38 million. <sighs> but anyways, not only was it a box office flop, but a lot of people apparently hated it. The reviews were bad, critics went to town on it and totally buried it. But they did that with the original thing too, right? And I know a lot of people are coming out and they're saying like, well, no, I like the thing prequel. Like when I posted on Instagram that I was going to do this episode, there was people that were like, I actually enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. I don't think I had any people come at me and were like, oh yeah, this movie sucked. So even years after, despite it being a box office flop, despite the critics and reviewers hating it, there's still a cult following for it, so it did follow in the footsteps of John Carpenter's The Thing. And the film did earn an additional $10,436,405 through Blu-ray and DVD sales when it was released on January 31st, 2012 in the US on Blu-ray and DVD. So now let's dive in and talk about The Thing and how the story of this horror franchise kicks off because this is considered a prequel. This film takes place before John Carpenter's The Thing. We start off the movie in the winter of 1982. There is an alien spacecraft and a nearby alien body that are discovered buried in Antarctic ice. They are discovered by members of the Norwegian research station Thule. We then meet an American paleontologist, Kate Lloyd, who's recruited by Dr. Sander Halverson and an assistant, Adam Finch, to investigate the crash that they found. They fly over to Thule in a helicopter with pilots Sam Carter and Derek Jameson, along with crewman Griggs, and they meet station chief Edward Wolner, along with his team of Juliet, Carl, Jonas, Henrik, Colin, Peter, Lars, and Lars's dog as well. The alien body they find, they excavate it in a block of ice and return it to the fuel station. 
During a party, Jameson sees that the aliens burst out from the ice block. So panic ensues. They start searching for the alien, and they find Lars's dog dead. The alien then drags Henrik into itself, splattering blood on Olaf. The group ends up killing the alien with a flamethrower, and an autopsy finds that the alien cells were copying Henrik's. Olaf then begins to fall ill. So Carter, Jameson, and Griggs, they're taking off in the helicopter to take Olaf to a medical facility. In the meantime, Griggs transforms into a monstrous creature and attacks Olaf, which causes the helicopter to crash in the mountains. Back at the base, Kate discovers dental fillings in a bloodied shower, and then tells the team that the alien can assimilate and imitate its victims, and it's now living among them. So Edward orders the team to drive to the closest base, but Juliet and Kate want to prevent anyone from leaving. They want to contain this. They don't want any contamination or contagion, whatever this is. Get out, infect more people. Who knows, an alien invasion might start at this moment, so they're, they're playing it safe. Good for them. Juliet lures Kate into an abandoned room before transforming into the alien and attacking her. Kate escapes, though, and the Juliet thing, creature-looking thing, <laughs> kills Carl, while Lars kills the thing with a flamethrower, and the rest of the team gets to quarantine themselves until the threat is eliminated. That same night, Carter and Jameson stagger back from the crashed helicopter. They're now suspected to be aliens. They get imprisoned and put into isolation. It's then realized by the crew that the alien thing doesn't assimilate inorganic material. So Kate had found those dental fillings earlier in the shower. So she proposes that they start checking everyone for dental fillings to find out, well, who's the thing. But at the same point, if you don't have fillings, this can also put you in a pretty bad situation. Which is another element that plays on that, well, human element, right? You're now not trusted because you're different than everybody else. So if you don't have fillings, you're different. You're now put into isolation and under a microscope. The test when they're checking for fillings ends up implicating Sander, Edward, Adam, and Colin as none of them have fillings. When Lars goes to get Carter and Jameson for testing, he ends up getting abducted. Carter and Jameson, they end up breaking into the main building and shoot Peter dead and puncture his flamethrower tank, which causes an explosion knocks Edward out unconscious. They bring Edward into the main room and he violently transforms and ends up infecting Jonas and Jameson and then gruesomely assimilates Adam in a really cool spectacle. Kate ends up burning Jonas and Jameson before they can truly transform and then she heads out with Carter to pursue the thing which then assimilates itself into Sander. It's just shape-shifting itself into anybody and everyone at this point. So the thing ends up driving off into the night in a snowcat and gets pursued by Kate and Carter as well. However, the spacecraft that they found suddenly activates, which separates them. Kate ends up falling into the ship and confronts the thing. She kills him with a grenade, and then it shuts down the ship's engines as well. Kate goes out to find Carter, and while they're in the truck, notices that his earring is missing. His response is that, oh, it's the wrong ear. But Kate burns him, realizing that, well, he's a thing, can't regrow organic mater inorganic material. So after burning the Carter thing, she moves to the second snowcat, drives away, and tries to head towards the Russian station. The next morning, we see Thule's helicopter and the pilot return. He checks out the ruined station and the husk of the Edward Adam thing that was completely burned, and he looks on in horror. Collins committed suicide at this point, and Lars demands at gunpoint that the helicopter pilot show his teeth. And now we remember at the beginning of the film, Lars is dead. Lars's dog was thought to be killed. However, he's not. He emerges and runs away. Lars then orders the helicopter pilot to give chase and kill the dog, realizing now that the dog is the thing. And then that heads us right into the beginning of the Thing movie. John Carpenter's The Thing. And it was a great way to segue in. Like, if you're watching the prequel film leading in to John Carpenter's The Thing, great segue. Because the opening scene of John Carpenter's The Thing is the end credit scene here for the prequel The Thing, which I thought was a great tie-in. Great way to connect the two movies. I loved the prequel. 
Like, the prequel had a lot of similarities and a lot of things that were connected with John Carpenter's The Thing. And after we go through these two movies here, we're going to talk about the similarities between the two as well and how they're connected, what they did right, what they did wrong, all that kind of stuff. We're going to go dive deep into that after this as well. Now, without further ado, the moment I know many of you have probably been waiting for, <laughs> let's talk about John Carpenter's The Thing. Let's head into our next movie in the Decades in Review series for the 1980s. This movie came out in 1982. However, the development of the film began in the mid-1970s. It started when David Foster and fellow producer Lawrence Terman had suggested to Universal Pictures that they were going to do an adaptation of the 1938 John Campbell novella, Who Goes There? It was loosely adapted once before in the 1951 film The Thing from Another World, but Foster and Terman wanted to develop a project that stuck more closely to the source material. John Carpenter was first approached about the project in 1976, so he knew about this even before he did Halloween, because Halloween came out in 1978, and he was approached about this in 76. Pretty crazy that they, they had Carpenter build to do this even before his claim to fame with Halloween. However, Carpenter at the time was mainly an independent film director, so because of this, Universal decided to pass and chose Toby Hooper to direct the film, believe it or not. So Toby Hooper was originally signed on because they had him under contract. He was originally signed on to be the director of the thing. Could you imagine a Texas Chainsaw Massacre style movie with the thing? I don't know. I don't think it would have been bad, actually. I think Toby Hooper could have done it. I, I think it might have been... A little bit more slasher, maybe body horror-esque than Carpenter did. But I think having Toby Hooper direct the thing, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a movie I need now. I kind of want to see how Toby Hooper's take on it would have been. The reason why, at the end of the day, we didn't get Toby Hooper as director was the producers of the thing were ultimately unhappy with Hooper and the concept that his writing partner had come up with. There was several more failed pitches by a bunch of different writers, brought on a whole bunch of different directors as well. They even brought on John Landis to the project. The project was then put on hold until a 1979 science fiction horror film was released by Ridley Scott, titled Alien. That actually helped revitalize the project, at which point Carpenter came back on and became loosely attached following the success of his film wonder what it was halloween <laughs> surprise surprise at first though carper was at first though carpenter was completely reluctant to join the project he thought hawk's adaptation was going to be difficult to surpass even though he considered the film's monster was completely unnotable at the time so cohen suggested to carpenter that he reread the original novella Carpenter then regained his interest in the project because he found that the creepiness of the imitations conducted by the creature and the questions it raised really interesting and something that would be fun for him to explore and expand on. He drew parallels between the novella and Agatha Christie's mystery novel and then there were none. He noted that the story of who goes there was timely for him, meaning that he could make it true to his day and not have it so dated if he were to completely rewrite the story from its source material. So Universal set the initial budget for John Carpenter's The Thing to $10 million with $200,000 for creature effects, which at the time was way more than the studio had ever allocated to a quote-unquote monster or creature feature. So they obviously had high hopes that this movie was going to be some sort of box office success for them. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> However, that wouldn't be the end of the money pot for Universal when it came to John Carpenter's The Thing. It's estimated that Universal's production would require at least $17 million before marketing and other costs, as the plan involved more set construction, there needed to be external sets, a large set piece for the original scripted death of Bennings. That was estimated to cost $1.5 million alone. And then as more storyboarding and designs were finalized, the crew estimated at that point that they were going to need at least $750,000 for creature effects. 
which they already got $200,000, and that's already more than any studio has given for this kind of movie before. Yet Universal executives agreed to it after seeing the number of workers employed under Rob Bottom, which was the special makeup's effects designer. Then they put this guy named Larry Franco in charge of making the budget work for the film, <laughs> which, man, I feel for that dude. That is a shitty job to have when you've been given a budget and then they come back to them and say, I need three times more than what, more than three times what you, what you have proposed for a budget from $200,000 for creature effects to $750,000 for creature effects. And you gotta be the guy who makes the budget work for the film. I do not envy his job at all. But he did, he did make some cuts to try and keep it within budget. He cut the filming schedule by a third and eliminated the exterior sets for on-site shooting and then removed an extravagant death scene as well. It was also suggested to reuse the destroyed American camp as the ruined Norwegian camp which saved them a further $250,000. When they started filming the thing in August, it had a budget of $11.4 million, and indirect costs brought it up to $14 million. The effects budget alone ran over and totaled $1.5 million. The effects budget alone on John Carpenter's The Thing was $1.5 million in 1982. God, that's incredible. I can't believe, you know, it surprises me that they got it more than anything. Like, you know that the 80s was the golden era for horror and disturbing films because of the fact that movie companies and production companies were funneling money into anything and everything that was horror in the 80s like universal didn't even squ like squawk they're like oh, okay we gave you a budget of 10 million dollars now you need another five million dollars or four million dollars okay it's a horror movie <laughs> if that was today man rob zombie couldn't even get an increase freaking for house of a thousand corpses which was i would probably say as much of a reach as the thing was for 1982 and it was universal as well and he couldn't even... <laughs> oh man that's funny so because of the fact that the effects budget ran over so much it forced them to eliminate some scenes including a confrontation of a creature dubbed the box thing and by the end of production carpenter had to make a personal appeal to an executive for $100,000 to complete a simplified version of the Blair thing. So the final cost was $12.4 million for the film, and overhead costs brought it up to $15 million. So the thing costed $15 million to make. God, it's incredible they were even able to get that much for a horror movie. Like, you know that Halloween just took off for Carpenter and the fog and everything that came between 78 and 82 for them to trust him with that much money on making a horror movie. Incredible. Just incredible. It's sad that it, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit, but it's sad that it didn't get the love it should have gotten on, on release. It, it's sad, but it, it has it now. It's got tons of love now. That's really what matters, right? At the end of the day, so several writers were brought on board to develop drafts for the thing before Carpenter had ended up becoming involved. This included a writer named William Nolan, who's notable for his time on Logan's Run, novelist David Wiltsey, and Toby Hooper, and Henkel was also there as well, to provide their own versions of drafts for the, uh, for the story of the thing. Now Carpenter took a look at those uh, scripts and called them awful <laughs> so he said they changed the story into something it wasn't and he and they ignored the shape-shifting aspect of the thing which carpenter found to be really the most important aspect of the story is the fact that this thing can shape-shift itself into other humans however carpenter didn't want to write the project himself because he just completed work on escape from new york and he was struggling to complete a screenplay for the philadelphia experiment so he was 
super wary of taking on any writing duties and prefer to just, you know, let someone else do it. Bill Lancaster was then brought on and talked to about being the writer for the thing, and he was hired to write the script after describing his vision for the film and that he was intending to stick very closely to the original story. It doesn't hurt that, you know, Carpenter was a fan of his work on The Bad News Bears, a 1976 film, so the two of them began working together on developing the story. Lancaster himself conceived several key scenes in the film, which included the Norris thing biting Dr. Copper and the use of blood tests to identify the thing, which actually Carpenter cited as the reason he wanted to work on the film was that concept alone. However, Lancaster found some challenges when he was trying to translate the source material from Who Goes There to film, because it features very little action in the actual source material itself. So he made significant changes to the story, such as reducing the number of characters from 37 to 12, because he thought that 37 was a bit excessive and it would be difficult for audiences to follow. Also, it leaves very little screen time for characterization. Total fair point. Total fair point. Because if you have too many people in a movie like that and you're not eliminating them quick enough so that you know the audience can focus on who the important people of the story are, you're not going to connect with any characters and at the end of the day, you're, you're just not going to give a shit about the movie. So Lancaster wrote about 30 to 40 pages of the script and then started to struggle with the second act of the film. It actually took him several months to complete the script in its entirety. Then once it was finished, Lancaster and Carpenter ended up spending a weekend in Northern California refining the script together. Each of them, of course, had different takes on how a creature should sound, and then they compared their ideas for each of the scenes as well. Lancaster's script, it opted to keep the creature largely concealed throughout the film, and it was Boughton who actually convinced Carpenter to make it more visible so it had a greater impact on the audience. The original ending that Lancaster had wrote was McCready and Childs turning into the thing, and then in the spring the characters would be rescued by helicopter, greeting their saviors as they came. However, Carpenter found this ending to just be too shallow. The novella itself, it concludes with the humans clearly victorious, but they get concerned because they see that there's birds flying towards the mainland and they may have been infected by the thing. Carpenter instead opted to end the film with the survivors slowly freezing to death to save humanity from infection, believing this to be, of course, the ultimate heroic act that they can make for, for the human race. So now that the film was written and ready to go, casting started to get underway. Kurt Russell was involved in the production even before being casted, he, he was actually helping Carpenter develop his ideas. And despite this, he was actually the last actor to be casted in the film, which is funny considering most people look at the thing and they think of Kurt Russell. And Carpenter had worked with Kurt Russell before, uh, twice actually, but he wanted to keep his options open for the leading role. There were discussions with the studio that involved using actors like Christopher Walken or Jeff Bridges or Nick Nolte, but all of them were unavailable or declined. Tom Atkins and Jack Thompson were actually pretty strong early on as being considered for the role as well, but the decision ultimately in the end was made to go with Kurt Russell, and it actually took Kurt Russell about a year to grow his hair and beard out for the role. So that's how long I gotta wait. I gotta grow my hair and beard out for a year to get that look that Kurt Russell had. I love that look. I, 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 I know a lot of people might chirp on me for that that look that kurt russell had man that volume hair and that big beard man i could go for that that's that's a look <laughs> that's a look jeffrey holder carl weathers and bernie casey they were all considered for the role of childs and carpenter also actually looked at isaac hayes having worked with him on escape from new york i love isaac hayes by the way rest in peace god bless his soul isaac hayes was such a great guy that voice as soon as you hear him speak, was so iconic. Not just because he was chef in, in South Park, but also he was sh Shaft. Isaac Hayes is the original Shaft. And if you don't know what Shaft is, go look it up. S-H-A-F-T. He's a bad mother, shut your mouth. <laughs> you've got to look up Shaft if you've never seen Shaft. Oh my God, I hope you've seen Shaft. And another funny thing is, is that um, a front runner for the role was actually Ernie Hudson of Ghostbusters fame. But ultimately, they went with Keith David, which I love. I love Keith David, too. Keith, da Keith David's great. He's done a lot of good voice work. I love his voice work. I love a lot of his acting, too. He's, he's a great, great actor. Rest in peace him, too. Keith David passed, too, didn't he? Man, all the good ones are going. That's sad. 
But anyways, no sadness, no sadness. And speaking of Keith David, The Thing was actually his first significant film role. He had uh, come from a theater background, and he had to learn on set how to hold himself back and not show every emotion his character was feeling. So the storyboard for Thing was extensively done by Mike Plogg and Mentor Hubner before filming began. Their work was so detailed that a lot of the film shots actually replicate the image layout completely. And it was really pushed to use anemophoric format aspect ratio because it allowed for placing several actors in an environment and makes use of the scenic vistas that were available at the time, while still creating a sense of content confinement within the image itself. It also enabled the use of negative space around the actors to imply something may just be lurking off screen that we're not able to see. Principal photography on the thing began on August 24th, 1981 in Juneau, Alaska. Filming lasted about 12 weeks and Carpenter insisted on about two weeks of rehearsals before filming because he wanted to see how the scenes were going to play out. And this was super unusual at the time because, well, there's expense involved. You're literally having the actors out there, you're doing the scenes as if you're filming, but you're not filming. So, of course, there was extra expense involved in that that's not really going to come to fruition. It'll, you'll get an ROI on it later because the film you know, was a success, but still a risk, still a risk. After that, they moved filming of the film to the Universal lot, where the outside heat was about 38 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the internal sets were climate controlled to 28 degrees Fahrenheit minus 2 degrees Celsius so that they could facilitate their work. The team had considered building the sets inside an existing refrigerated structure, but they were unable to find one large enough, so instead they collected as many portable air conditioners as they could, closed off the stage, and then used humidifiers and misters so they could add moisture to the air. Like I said before, creativity, John Carpenter, was creative as fuck. If he wanted an effect, if he wanted to create an atmosphere, no amount of money was going to stop that man or no lack of technology is going to get in John Carpenter's way. He is going to execute his vision every single time. And this is why John Carpenter movies, even if they're not, you know, the best horror movie of all time, they're always bangers. Like, you're going to notice, guys, as we go through the rest of this season, I'm going over a lot of John Carpenter movies because... They're the cream of the crop. Carpenter knows horror. Carpenter knows suspense. I would even go so far as to say, and I know that this may be controversial, this may get me some heat, and I may lose some people for this. I would go so far as to say that Carpenter is the modern-day Lovecraft. He is a modern-day H.P. Lovecraft. Because of the way that he can incorporates suspense in his stories he can develop an atmosphere that makes you scared of what you don't see right like look at halloween if you were scared at halloween that's because you didn't see michael myers because michael myers was in the first halloween movie for maybe about i think it was nine or ten minutes of screen time in a 90 minute movie but you were scared throughout but you were scared of what you weren't seeing what was not there Carpenter has an amazing way of making you be afraid of the unknown, just like Lovecraft did. So that's why I would say Carpenter is a modern-day Lovecraft, hands down. So Carpenter ended up watching a roughly assembled cut of the film, and he was super unhappy that the film seemed to feature too many scenes of men standing around talking. So he rewrote some of the already completed scenes to take place outdoors and be shot on location when principal photography was moving to Stewart, British Columbia. Carpenter was so determined to use authentic locations instead of studio sets, and his success on Halloween and The Fog, it gave him that credibility to take on this bigger budget production of The Thing. So a film scout found an area just outside Stewart, British Columbia, along the Canadian coast, beautiful place by the way, and it offered the project both ease of access and scenic value during the day for shooting. So on December 2nd, 1981, about 100 American and Canadian crew members ended up moving to that area to begin filming. And during their journey there, the crew bus actually slid in the snow toward the unprotected edge of the road, and it nearly sent them down a 500-foot embankment. The sets had actually been built in the summertime in Alaska, atop a rocky area which overlooked a glacier, 
because they were preparing for snow to fall and cover them. These were used for both interior and exterior filming, meaning that they couldn't be heated above freezing because they needed to ensure there was always snow on the roof. Outside, the temperature was so cold that the camera lenses would freeze and break. So the crew had to leave the cameras in freezing temperatures, but at the same time, the crew had to leave the cameras in the freezing temperatures because if they kept them inside, the warmth would result in foggy lenses that took hours for them to clear up. So filming greatly depended on the weather. <laughs> like, if the weather didn't permit, the filming didn't go on. So it took them three weeks to complete this round of filming. Heavy snow just made it impossible for them to film on some days. And it took them eight hours alone just to rig the explosives that they needed to destroy the set in the film's finale. It took them eight hours just to set up that one moment in the film. In post-production, several scenes in the script were completely omitted from the film because sometimes there was just too much dialogue and it slowed the pace and it completely undermines the suspense of the film, which obviously is what Carpenter's going for. He wants to build that suspense. Although some of the issues that he had seen, he blamed on his directorial method. He noted that several scenes appeared to be repeating events or information. Carpenter also filmed multiple endings for the thing, which included a quote-unquote happier ending, because the editor, Todd Ramsey, thought that the bleak conclusion wouldn't test well with audiences. In the alternate take, we have McCready being rescued and given a blood test that proves he's not infected. But Carpenter said that stylistically, this ending would have been too cheesy, which it absolutely would have been. Carpenter knows his audience. He knows the assignment. If you put an ending like that in, he's going to be like, come on, they're, they're not going to buy this. So a new editor, Verna Fields, was tasked with reworking the ending to add clarity and resolution to the film. It was finally decided to just create an entirely new scene, which omitted the suspicion of Childs being infected by removing him completely, leave, leaving McCready alone. This new ending, it tested only slightly better with audiences than the original ending, and the production team agreed to the studio's request to use it anyways. So it was set to go to print for theaters when the producers and John Carpenter decided that the film was better left with, amb with ambiguity instead of nothing at all. So Carpenter gave his approval to restore the ambiguous ending, but a scream was inserted over the outpost explosion to pose at the monster's death. However, Universal executives disliked the ending, and according to Carpenter, they told him, think about how the audience will react if we see the thing die with a giant orchestra playing. <laughs> God damn it. Studio executives think they know it all, eh? They think they know what the fans want. They don't know shit. Carpenter uh, later noted that both the original ending and the ending without Childs tested poorly with audiences, which he interpreted as the film simply not being heroic enough. So let's talk about some of my favorite parts of this film, which are the creature effects. They were largely designed by Bond, and he'd previously worked with Carpenter on The Fog, which was another great movie. Check out episode one of the podcast. We, we went over The Fog great John Carpenter film. And when Boughton joined the project in mid-1981, pre-production was already in progress, but no design had been settled on what the thing was going to look like. So artist Dale Culpers was brought in, and he'd created some preliminary paintings of the creature's look, but he left the project because he was hospitalized after a traffic accident. So Carpenter conceived the thing as a single creature, but Boughton suggested that it should be constantly changing and able to look like anything and anyone. This description was initially considered by Carpenter as just too weird, and he had him work with Plug to sketch them instead. As part of the thing's design, it was agreed that anyone assimilated by it would be a perfect imitation and would not know that they were the thing. So the actors spent hours during rehearsals discussing whether they would know they were the thing when they were taken over, but Clennon said that it did not matter because everyone acted, looked, and smelled exactly the same before or after being taken over by the thing. At its peak, Boughton had a 35-person crew of artists and technicians on this film. That's amazing. That is a huge crew to have for just special effects. And he found it difficult, of course, to actually work with that many people in executing the vision of the thing. So to help manage the team, he had hired Eric Jensen, who was a special effects line producer, and he had worked with him on the 1981 horror film The Howling. In designing the thing's different forms, Boughton explains that the creature had been all over the galaxy at this point. 
This allowed it to call on different attributes as it was necessary, such as stomachs that transform into giant mouths, spider legs sprouting from heads, you know, that kind of thing. I guess you have that kind of evolution in space, right? And Bond admitted that he had no idea how his designs would be implemented practically, even though Carper didn't reject them at all. And Bonton was very sensitive about his designs, and he was worried about the film showing too many of them, actually. At one point, as a preemptive move against any censorship, Bonton actually suggested making the creature's violent transformations and the appearance of the internal organs more fantastical by using colors. <laughs> the decision was made, though, to tone down the color of the blood and viscera, although much of the filming was completed by that point. And they made the creature effects using a variety of materials, including mayonnaise, creamed corn, microwaved bubblegum, and KY jelly. Microwaved bubblegum. Man, these people were creative as fuck. Like, who's going to think of microwave and bubble? Man, that's awesome. That is pretty cool. Now, during filming, Botton unfortunately was hospitalized for exhaustion, double pneumonia, and a bleeding ulcer. That's fucking terrible. And it was because of his extensive workload. Botton himself explained that he would hoard all the work, basically. Which I get that. I get being a workaholic and not trusting people to do the job right. Like, I, 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 I understand the hoard the work concept, man. I feel for this guy. He opted to be directly involved in many of the complicated tasks, and his dedication to the project saw him spend over a year living on the Universal lot. And he didn't take a day off during that time, and he slept on the sets or in locker rooms. And then he tried to also take some of the pressure off his crew by enlisting the aid of special effects creator Stan Winston to help complete some of the designs, including the dog thing. And since he really didn't have enough time to create such a sophisticated mechanical creature, Winston opted to create a hand puppet. So a cast was made of makeup artist Lance Anderson's arm and head, around which the dog thing was sculpted in oil-based clay. The final foam latex puppet, which was worn by Anderson, featured radio-controlled ears and cable-controlled legs, and it was operated from below a raised set on which the kennel was built. Slime from the puppet would leak onto Anderson during the two days it took to film the scene, and he had to wear a helmet to protect himself from the explosive squibs simulating gunfire. Anderson pulled the tentacles into the dog thing, and reverse motion was used to create the effect of them slithering from its body. In the chest chomp scene, Dr. Comper attempts to revive Norris with a defibrillator, revealing himself as the thing. Norris Thing's chest transforms into a large mouth that severs Copper's arms. Botton actually accomplished this scene by recruiting a double amputee and fitting him with prosthetic arms filled with wax bones, rubber veins, and jello. The arms were then placed into the practical quote-unquote stomach mouth where the mechanical jaws clamped down on them, at which point the actor pulled away, severing the false arms. The effect of the Norris thing's head detaching from the body to, to save itself, it took months of testing before Botton was satisfied enough to film it. The scene involved a fire effect, but the crew were unaware that fumes from rubber foam chemicals inside the puppet were flammable. So the fire ignited the fumes, creating a large fireball that just completely engulfed the puppet. Thankfully, it only suffered minimal damage after the fire had been put out and the crew was able to successfully film the scene. So, leading up to the release of the film, there really wasn't a lot of information about the film's special effects, which drew a lot of attention from film exhibitors. They wanted some sort of reassurance that The Thing was a first-rate production, which was capable of attracting audiences. So, Cohen and Foster put together a 20-minute show reel, which emphasized the action and suspense of The Thing. They used available footage, including alternate and extended scenes which weren't even in the finished film, but they avoided revealing the special effects as much as possible. The reaction they received was generally positive, and they were told that the studio was really counting on the thing's success because they expected that E.T. was going to only appeal to children, which they were right, obviously. While finalizing the film, Universal had sent Carpenter a demographic study showing that the audience appeal of horror films was declining, by 70% over the previous six months. So Carpenter considered this a suggestion that he lower his expectations on the film's performance. So The Thing gets released in the United States on June 25th, 1982. During its opening weekend, the film earned $3.1 million and actually finished behind Poltergeist, which had made $4.1 million that weekend. And it was already in its fourth weekend of release at the time and it dropped out of the top 10 films after three weeks, 
ending its box office run with a total of $19.6 million. So it wasn't a box office failure, because it did make money. They had a $15 million budget. They earned a total of $19.6 million. So they made $4.6 million off that movie, but it wasn't a hit. It wasn't a smash su success like Halloween was or Friday the 13th. They didn't make millions upon millions of dollars, but they didn't lose money. The reception on the film was super negative. It received negative reviews when it was released, and it was so much hostility for the movie because of the fact that it was cynical, anti-authoritarian, and the graphic special effects, just people weren't ready for it. It was a movie that was ahead of its time. Like, it, you didn't see, you saw Alien. Alien had some really cool practical effects, and there was a little bit of gore there, right, with the chestburster scene, but you didn't have a movie like The Thing. And that's what Carpenter did, I feel like, in the 80s, right, in early 70s. Like, he was doing films no one else was doing. He was the first to market. Like, when it came to slasher films, yeah, there were slashers before. But there was no iconic slasher killers like Michael Myers, right? Like, when you think of the Mount Rushmore of slasher killers, yeah, there was Leatherface. But that was it, right? And Leatherface is a whole diff different breed than Michael Myers, right? You can't compare Texas Chainsaw Massacre with Halloween. Completely different breeds of slasher films. Carpenter came out and gave a new take on the, on the slasher genre. And it's what catapulted the slasher genre to what we know now. Because of Halloween, we got Friday the 13th. And so many other slasher movies that came after it. Like, Carpenter knew the assignment. And he wanted to give the audience films that they hadn't seen before. And some reviewers just completely dismissed the thing. They called it the quintessential moron movie of the 80s. Instant junk and a wretched excess. Like, did these people not know what good film was at the time? Like, I know there was a lot going on in the 80s. There was a lot of, you know, political turmoil. There's a lot of changes in society. So I get why there was hate on this movie. But I'm just really glad that people got their heads out of their asses and realized how good this movie is. And that it's honestly a masterclass in practical effects. It really is. Like, this movie has the best, I would say, the best practical effects of the early 80s. Like, really, what other movie would you say had practical effects that can match the thing around this time? Like, I know movies came out after it that, you know, had great practical effects. But what movie in the early 1980s had effects like the thing? No one did. But at the same point, did they have $15 million budget? <laughs> All right. Carpenter was given a lot of money to execute his vision. And he did it well. He, he, he knew the assignment and he got it done. They still made money, even though it wasn't as glorious or glamorous as Halloween or Friday the 13th. But anyways, let's now head into the plot of the movie and talk about the thing. Like I said, it starts off really from uh, the end of the prequel film. We see the helicopter that was at the end of the prequel movie pursuing the sled dog, which then ends up at an American research station. And these researchers, they witness as the passenger accidentally blows up the helicopter and the pilot. The man starts shooting at the dog and shouts at the Americans in Norwegian, but they're completely unable to understand him. He ends up being shot dead in self-defense by the station commander Gary. And then we have McCready and Dr. Copper heading to investigate the Norwegian base. They find charred ruins, frozen corpses, and they also find a burnt corpse of a malformed humanoid, which they then transfer to the American station. Their biologist, Blair, begins to perform an autopsy on their remains and, you know, finds a normal set of human organs. Nothing, nothing to be seen here. Everything's good. Everything's fine. So Clark kennels the sled dog, and it soon starts to metamorphosize and absorbs several of the other station dogs. This disturbance alerts the team, and Child starts to use a flamethrower to incinerate the creature. Blair then autopsies the dog thing, and he surmises that whatever this thing is, it can perfectly imitate other organisms. The data that they recovered from the Norwegian base leads the Americans to a large excavation site, which contains a partially buried alien spacecraft, what we saw in the prequel film. Norris estimates that this spacecraft has been buried for over 100,000 years. So Blair starts to grow paranoid after running a computer simulation that indicates the creature could assimilate all life on Earth in a matter of years. So the station implements controls to reduce the risk of assimilation. They start to isolate themselves when the malformed humanoid remains assimilate Bennings, but Windows interrupts this process and McCready burns the Bennings thing now. 
The team also ends up imprisoning Blair in a tool shed because he sabotages all of the crew's vehicles. The team also imprisons Blair in a tool shed because he's found to be sabotaging the vehicles, killing the remaining sled dogs, and destroying the radio to prevent them to escape. Copper suggests at this time that testing for infection is the best thing to do. They need to do some tests to figure out who is the thing and who is actually a human. So they compare the crew's blood against uncontaminated blood that was held in storage. But after learning that the blood stores have been destroyed, the men start to lose faith in Gary's leadership. So McCrady takes command at this point. McCrady, Windows, and Nulls, they find Fuchs' burned corpse and surmise that he's committed suicide to avoid assimilation. Windows returns to the base, while McCrady and Nulls investigate McCrady's shack. During the return, Nulls abandons McCrady in a snowstorm, believing that he's been assimilated because he finds his torn clothes in the shack. So now they're beginning to turn on each other. Now there's a lot of that paranoia, that feeling of isolation. You can't trust anybody, every man for themselves. That was something I really loved about the thing, is that they just took that human element of not being able to trust anybody, and the only person that you can rely on is yourself. They took it to a whole new level. But then at the same point, can you really rely on yourself? Because these people don't know that they're the thing, right? So not only are you creating paranoia amongst each other, you're creating paranoia and suspense in, in, inside yourself. Like it's, oh, I just, I love the undertones of the thing. Because if you really dive deep into the movie and you really just sink your teeth into its core concepts, man, this movie is just absolutely incredible. Absolutely phenomenal. A masterclass in suspense, practical effects. This is definitely, I would say, in my top three John Carpenter films. Like, if I had to rate John Carpenter films, I would probably say the probably number two. You know, not number two, right behind Halloween. While I, while I feel like Halloween pushed the slasher genre in a direction that could be more mainstream and accepted by society, John Carpenter did the same thing with sci-fi and practical effects. Like, yes, you know, Ridley Scott broke it with Alien, I won't, I won't take that away and say the thing, you know, brought sci-fi to mainstream audiences. It didn't. Alien did. Absolutely. Ridley Scott's Alien is what brought sci-fi to the mainstream and gave audiences who may not have been into science fiction at the time a chance to really be scared and experience something they've never experienced before. Ridley Scott owns that. Alien, that was the first of its kind. But the thing really took it to a new level. Because in Alien, you don't really see much, right? Alien has a lot of suspense and it has a lot of tension. Where the thing, you see the thing. You see what it does. You see the effects that it has, not only from a physical standpoint, but from a mental standpoint. And that's what I feel like John Carpenter really nailed with the thing in 1982. And if only people could have seen it for what it was at the time and got past the the gore and the practical effects and all the things they found disturbing, they would have found such an iconic and amazing story deep within all of that. So back at the base, McCready arrives and the team's debating whether or not to allow him back inside. However, he breaks back in and then holds the group at bay with dynamite. And during the encounter, Norris appears to suffer a heart attack. So Copper attempts to help and revive Norris but his chest transforms into a large mouth and bites off Copper's arms, effectively killing him. McCrady then incinerates the Norris thing, but its head detaches and then attempts to escape before also being burnt. McCrady hypothesizes that the Norris thing demonstrated that every part of the thing is actually an individual life form with its own survival instinct. So it's not just one big organism. It's one big organism containing several different other living organisms with a life of their own. So McCrady proposes testing blood samples from each survivor with a heated piece of wire. Because of course, the thing has a survival instinct, so if you try to attack it, it's going to make its presence known. So he has each man restrained, but is forced to kill Clark after he lunges at McCrady with a scalpel. Everyone passes the blood test, except Palmer, whose blood recoils from the heat. At this point, Palmer's exposed and he transforms into the thing, breaks free of his bonds, and then he infects Windows, which forces McCready to incinerate them both. So Childs is left on guard now, while the others go to test Blair, only to find out that he's escaped, and he's been using vehicle components to assemble a small flying saucer, which of course they end up destroying. 
Upon their return, they find the child is missing and the power generator is now destroyed, which leaves the men without any heat. McCready speculates that, now that they have no way of escape, the thing intends to return to hibernation until a rescue team arrives. So McCready, Gary, and Knowles, they agree that the thing cannot be allowed to escape, and they set explosives to destroy the station. But the Blair thing ends up killing Gary and Knowles disappears. The Blair thing then transforms into an enormous creature and breaks the detonator. But McCready triggers the explosives with a stick of dynamite, effectively destroying the station. Childs returns as McCready's sitting by the burning remnants, and he says he became lost in the storm while pursuing Blair. Exhausted and slowly freezing to death, they both acknowledge that uh, they distrust each other and share a bottle of scotch whiskey. Great way to end the film. Like, I know there was a lot of debate on how the film should have ended. There was a lot of changes, a lot of alternate ending shot, put in, taken out. I feel like leaving the ending ambiguous was the best thing they could have done. Because the whole movie was suspenseful. The whole movie had you wondering and asking questions. So to leave you with a question at the end, like, is McCready infected? Is Childs infected? Are they both going to die? Is a rescue team going to come? Will the thing spread? There's so many questions that are left. It's an ambiguous ending. And in that kind of movie, an ambiguous ending is the best way to go. Because it's just like Carpenter said, if you went with a happy ending and, you know, rescue team shows up and it's just McCready there and he's chilling by the burning remnants and he's about to die, but they come and save him in time. That would have been a cheesy fucking ending for a horror movie. You're like, oh, happy ending. Yay, they saved him and he went up. Like, no, you don't want that kind of ending. You want the ending where it's like, okay, are they going to die? Are they going to freeze to death? Is the thing still... Like, you want to ask those questions. Why? Because if you still have questions and you don't have closure in a horror movie, chances are you may be scared after watching that movie. And that's what Carpenter wants. Carpenter wants to scare you. That's the whole reason he made Halloween. That's why he made the thing in the fog. He makes movies so he can scare people. He wants you to be scared. He wants you to be held in suspense. And that's what he did with the thing. He did a great job. So now that we're done talking about the thing and the thing, <laughs> okay, promise I'm done. We're now going to talk about the two together. And we're going to talk about really how the thing in 1982 compares to the original in 1951 and the remake in 2011. So we have three movies here, right? We have The Thing from Another World, which came out in 1951. Then we have The Thing in 1982 and The Thing in 2011. They all draw on John Campbell's novella, Who Goes There, for inspiration. And all three of the films, they have their share of fans. All three films take place in scientific outposts in the middle of a frozen wasteland. The 1951 film, however, is set in the Arctic, while the other two take place in Antarctica. The three films, they feature a male pilot as a major hero, although this character is the secondary protagonist in the 2011 film, as opposed to the primary antagonist, like he was in the, in the first two films. And every version of the thing involves some sort of alien that crash lands on Earth, and this beast winds up killing the researcher sled dogs. And an important consistency for all three heroes is that the only effective way to fight the thing is with fire. In the original film, the characters use a combination of kerosene and flare guns, where the other two used flamethrowers. That's really where the major similarities between the three movies end. There's a lot of differences, though. The thing from another world is the odd one of the bunch, really because the first titular thing isn't a shapeshifter. Instead, it's actually a humanoid creature, and the alien is described as a highly evolved vegetable, <laughs> believe it or not. In fact, one character in the movie actually refers to the monster as an intellectual carrot, but just like the later thing monsters, this extraterrestrial wants to reproduce, but it uses human blood to fertilize its seeds instead of assimilating and copying victims. That sounds way more terrifying, actually. <laughs> An intellectual carrot using human blood to fertilize its seeds. I, I find that more terrifying than assimilating and copying victims, but that's just my, my take. Another key difference is the cast of characters. In the 1982 and 2011 films, they featured a wide variety of people from multiple walks of life. There was a lot of diversity. However, the 1951 film focuses on a more homogenized group of scientists and soldiers which makes it actually the only movie in the thing universe i guess you can say to feature military characters and since the film was released during the height of the cold war these soldiers are clean-cut square-jawed heroes and the creature itself is really a not so subtle reference to the soviets <laughs> ready to invade them at a moment's notice 
the scientists, they came off as slightly unhinged, right? I find that a lot of movies from the 50s and the 40s and even the 30s, they, they portray scientists as like mad scientists. It doesn't matter what, what scientists you are or what you're working on. If you're a scientist, you're like, oh, I'm a mad scientist. They also had the head researcher come off as a stereotypical selfish researcher, more concerned about gaining knowledge than, than preserving human life. Kind of your typical, you know, researcher in science kind of deal, the stereotype. And when the thing begins its bloody rampage, the researcher wants to protect the creature at the cost of everyone else living on the base. Because, of course, it's considered a superior being and he wants the alien to teach him the secrets of the universe. The 2011 version of the film actually shares a few similarities with the 51 version as well. The original focus was mainly on its male heroes, but both movies do feature female characters, while Carpenter's film doesn't. It actually doesn't have any female characters in it at all. And both films also show the researchers discovering the thing in a block of ice, along with villainous head scientists who are more concerned about gaining insight into the alien than following proper protocol. Overall, though, the 2011 thing has much more in common, of course, with the 1982 film, because it's a prequel to it. However, just like in the 1951 version, the 2011 version lacks the paranoia of the Carpenter film. Like, it tries to replicate all that same suspense and tension that Carpenter had in the 80s, but its very existence negates any lasting suspense. Like, the movie had, you know, some decent scares, some really good visuals and practical effects, but it does lack the surprise and suspense of the 1982 version because it's a prequel. We already know what's going to happen. We know everyone in that base is going to die, and the thing's going to escape and get out. And it does provide interesting insights into the 1982 film as well. It just doesn't deliver the same thrills. It's not as big and bold as the original was, but that's just my take on it. Well, that wraps us up for our special episode on The Thing and The Thing. <laughs> I know I said I was done, but it's just too funny. Okay, I'm, I'm real really done now. Thank you guys for putting up with me and <laughs> listening to this week's episode. I love The Thing. It's one of my favorite horror movies. I really watch it all the time because it's one of my girlfriend's comfort movies. So I've seen this movie a bunch of times, and it's really good every single time you watch it. So give it a rewatch if you haven't recently. And while you're at it, head on over to Instagram. Follow me on Instagram.com slash Cabin of Horrors Podcast. That way you can stay up to date with all of the latest episodes on the podcast. You can also get some cool horror movie fun facts that I've been posting there too. That's been a lot of fun. I like sharing that knowledge. And we'll be back again next week with a brand new episode. Make sure you're following on Instagram to know what we're going to go over on next week's episode. And until that time, see you in the shadows.